In this newest installment on our series of Haitian presidents, we analyze the history and context of the next few Haitian presidents, how did they come to power, and the legacy of their administration. We are going to continue until we've covered all presidents from Dessel into Juvenal. If you like this series, give us a thumbs up, a comment, and a share. With a better understanding, we can get a better Haiti. In our last episode, we finished with a discussion of President Faustin Sulu. And this is the episode we continue with more presidents from his term on the ward. Guillaume Fabit Nicolas Jeff Lau was a mulatto general in the Haitian army and president of Haiti from 1859 until his deposition in 1867. When General Charles Revere here launched a rebellion against dictator Jean Pierre Boyer in 1843, Jeff Fry joined him and was appointed lieutenant colonel. He is then sent to the town of Jeremy, where he defeated Boyer's troops, who he then pursued as far as the Tiburon Peninsula. After this military triumph, he was elevated to the rank of Brigadier General in 1844. On April 18, 1852, Faustin Suluk made him Duke of Tabar. After collaborating in a coup to remove Faustin Suluk from power in order to return Haiti to the social and political control of the colored elite, Jeff Rye was made president in 1859. To placate the peasants, he renewed the practice of selling state-owned lands and ended a schism with the Roman Catholic Church, which then took on an important role in improving education. Father Jeff Y assumed the presidency of Haiti in 1859 following the overthrow of Emperor Faustin Sulu. His presidency was characterized by a desire to stabilize the country and implement reforms. He formed his own presidential guards called Les Tirolers de la Garde, who were trained under him personally. In June 1859, Jeff Lau founded the National Law School and reinstituted the medical school that Boyer began. Jeff Lau sought to foster national unity and reconcile divisions that had arisen during previous administrations. He promoted a policy of amnesty aimed at bringing together different factions and healing political wounds. He also revived the policy of former rulers John Jacques Dessalines, Alexander Pichon, and Jean-Pierre Boyer of recruiting African Americans to settle in Haiti. In May 1861, a group of African Americans led by James Theodore Holly settled east of Kawade de Bouquet. However, by 1862, Jeff Lau began to examine the Constitution and eliminated the legislature to his own benefit. He first gave himself a raise and two plantations and paid for his personal luxuries with hospital funds and army funds. In 1863, he reformed the monetary system to that of the present day. Jeff Y worked to strengthen Haiti's diplomatic relations with other nations. He pursued international recognition and cooperation, seeking to position Haiti as an active participant in global affairs. During this time period, the Catholic Church was seen as the one international institution capable of recognizing Haitian independence due to the fact that the European powers as well as the United States had at that time refused to condemn slavery. Nicole Edge F. Lai inherited the project of advancing reconciliation between the Haitian state and the Vatican. Jeff Lau was a Catholic, which made him renounce any form of the voodoo faith. He gave orders to demolish altars, drums, and any other instruments used in ceremonies. In 1865, Major Sylvain Sound of began his takeover of the North and Artibonite part of Haiti. By May 15, both Jeff Rao and his government troops clashed with Sound of Northern troops. After using the Royal Navy for gunboat diplomacy with Sound of, the Jeff Y regime was in ruins especially financially. He reopened old wounds between North, West, and South Haitians and brought foreigners into domestic affairs. In 1866, a huge fire engulfed hundreds of houses and businesses. In March 1867, Jeff Rao and his family disguised themselves and fled to Jamaica, where he died in Kingston in 1878. Jeff Wow implemented economic policies aimed at stimulating trade and commerce with a focus on agriculture and industry. He aimed to boost the nation's economy and improve living conditions for the Haitian people. Sylvain Salon of a light-skinned mulatto was born in Cap Haitian in 1827, was a Haitian military officer who enlisted in the Haitian army in 1850. He was captain of the cavalry when Faba Jeff Y overthrew Faustin Sulu in January 1859 and was rewarded for his aid with the rank of major. 
a political figure who served as the president of Haiti from 1867 to 1869. Sylvain Sound of came to power through a military coup against President Fabergé Foy in 1867. His coup resulted in a change of government and marked a period of political instability in Haiti. After Geffroy's departure, the Council of the Secretaries of State became the supreme authority for a time. But in April 1867, Sound of arrived in Port-au-Prince, where he was given a hearty welcome. And on May 2, he became, together with Nisij Sage and Victor in Chevalier, a member of the provisional government which was organized. The National Assembly met at Port-au-Prince on May 6, 1867, and on June 2014 adopted a constitution which abolished the presidency for life, the duration of the authority vested in the chief of the executive power being fixed at four years. On the same day, Saunov was elected president of Haiti. Saunov's presidency was characterized by authoritarian rule and the suppression of political opposition. He imposed strict control over the country, curbing civil liberties and silencing dissent through violent means. During Saunov's presidency, Haiti faced significant economic challenges. The country experienced a severe economic downturn, worsened by political instability and mismanagement. This led to widespread poverty and economic hardship for the Haitian people. In 1869, Saunov's presidency came to an end when he was overthrown during a rebellion led by General Nisij Daje. Saunov succeeded in reaching the Dominican territory, but General Jose Maria Cabral, who was in sympathy with his opponents, betraying the trust he had placed in him, gave him up to the Haitians on January 15, 1870. Saunov arrived at Porto Prince, where he appeared before a court martial. He was sentenced to death and shot on the same day at 6 o'clock in the evening tied to a pole set up on the smoking ruins of the executive mansion. It's important to note that Saunov's presidency was relatively short-lived, yet it had significant repercussions for Haiti during a period already marked by political turbulence. The events surrounding his presidency played a role in shaping the subsequent political landscape and influencing the country's trajectory. John Nicholas Nisij Sajes succeeded Sylvain Saunov as president of Haiti in 1869. Coming into power by Q, Sajet was the first Haitian president to serve out his term of office 1869 to 1874 and retire voluntarily, although his retirement led to a renewal of the political turmoil between blacks and the country's mulatto elites. He died in 1880. On March 19, 1870, the National Assembly elected General Nisich as a president of Haiti for a term of four years, expiring on May 15, 1874. During his presidency, Sajer attempted to observe the Constitution of 1867. Sajer ought to reconcile political factions and promote national unity. He implemented policies aimed at healing the divisions within Haitian society and fostering a sense of cohesion among the population. The liberals sought drastic change rather than trying to extend public liberty gradually, including by introducing the parliamentary system, trying to subject the executive power to the legislative body, and compelling those members of the cabinet who were not in sympathy with the House of Representatives to relinquish their offices. Saget's presidency was marked by a commitment to civil liberties and the rule of law. He sought to establish a system that respected individual rights, protected freedom of speech, and ensure justice and equality for all Haitians, prioritized economic development and sought to revitalize Haiti's economy. He implemented measures to promote agriculture, stimulate trade, attract foreign investment, and improve infrastructure to support economic growth. The House of Representatives and the Senate, which had met in April 1874, were to assemble a National Assembly in order to elect a new president. There were two candidates for the office, Mitchell Doming, Commandant of the Southern Department, supported by Sage and his followers, and Pierre Montplaisir Pierre, the candidate of the Liberal Party. Many of Pierre's supporters withdrew from the House because of a dispute over the validity of a key Pierre supporter's election, meaning that there was no quorum for the presidential election. Saget's term was to expire on May 15, 1874, and the Liberal Party tried to persuade him to remain in power until his successor could be elected. He emphatically refused, and on May 14, 1874, he relinquished the presidency to the Council of the Secretaries of State, having previously appointed Mitchell Doming Commander-in-Chief of the Haitian Army. At the end of his term, 
Nisij Sajja peacefully transferred power to his successor, paving the way for a smooth transition of government. On May 2020, he left Port-au-Prince for St. Mark on a donkey, where he lived until his death on April 7, 1880. Nisij Sagat's presidency is often remembered as a period of relative stability and reforms aimed at promoting economic development, education, and social progress. His emphasis on reconciliation, infrastructure development, and respect for civil liberties contributed to Haiti's social and political landscape during his time in office. Mitchell Doming was born in Lekai in 1813. He graduated from military training and became commander of army units in Sud. He, therefore, issued a decree on September 10, 1874, appointing Septimus Rameau to manage public functions as the vice president of the Council of Secretaries of State. Septimus Rameau thus became the true ruler of Haiti. Rameau was dictatorial and domineering by nature, while Mitchell Doming was more of a figurehead. One of Doming's first acts after his election to the presidency was the signing of an agreement with the Dominican Republic which the Haitian Congress refused to ratify. The agreement established the country's mutual recognition and, in particular, an end to the long and bloody border war between them. The chief of staff of President Domingue, General Leger, was sent to Santo Domingo to prepare a new agreement. Upon his return to Port-au-Prince on November 9, 1874, he was accompanied by Dominican negotiators to seal a treaty of friendship and an accord on trade and navigation. Haiti recognized and accepted the full independence of the Dominican Republic, and on January 20, 1875, the Treaty of Friendship was signed between the two countries. Despite this success in international politics, Haiti's domestic financial situation was devastating. Domingue tried to negotiate a loan with France, which would strain Haitian finances for years. Finally, corruption and fraud were so great that Domingue issued a decree, dated May 15, 1875, for the arrest of Generals Bryce, Pierre Montplaisir Pierre, and Wazirin Cano, his political opponent. Wazirin Cano criticized this financial policy and the loan. He took refuge at the Embassy of the United States, causing a diplomatic crisis between Haiti and the United States. Bryce and Pierre Montplaisir Pierre were killed while Wazirin Cano and other opponents fled abroad. Septimus Remote was accused of being responsible for the deaths of the two generals, as well as the proposed loan with France. He was himself assassinated on a street in Port-au-Prince. Doming resigned on April 15, 1876 and went into exile in Kingston, Jamaica, where he died a year later. Wazirin Kano was born on June 12, 1832 in Lekai, Haiti. He began a military career. He was an officer from 1858 to 1867 during the administration of Father Jeffrey. He then retired from military service and became a farmer. He was elected a senator in Port-au-Prince in 1870, after the riots of May 1875, after which he was holed up in the home of U.S. Ambassador Ebenezer Bassett for five months from May to October. He went into exile in Kingston, Jamaica, for a few weeks. On his return, he was appointed the commander of the army in the Alice Department by President Mitchell Doming. On April 23, 1876, he replaced Mitchell Doming as the first president of the provisional government, before becoming president of Haiti non-provisionally on July 17, 1876. The 1867 constitution gave him a mandate of four years. Wazirin Kano focused on implementing economic reforms to stimulate Haiti's economy. He aimed to attract foreign investment, promote trade, and improve infrastructure to support economic growth. Wazirin Kano recognized the importance of agriculture for Haiti's economy and implemented measures to promote agricultural development. He aimed to increase agricultural productivity, support farmers, and enhance food security in the country. Wazirin Kano faced political challenges during his presidency. Tensions in domestic politics and foreign affairs grew, particularly because of the differences between liberal and nationalist parties in parliament. Opposition and discontent within the country grew. Although the government managed to restore law and order, Wazirin Kano resigned as president on July 17, 1879, unable to mediate between the liberal and national parties. The successor to the presidency was Lysia Salomon. After his resignation, Wazirin Kano left again in exile in Jamaica. This has been just a few of the presidents of Haiti. In fact, Haiti has had 58 presidents, 
so the few we just covered here are only the beginning of a series we intend to have. Click the playlist to view our previous episodes. And if you enjoyed this video and would like us to provide the complete list of Haitian presidents from 1804 to today, please like, comment, and share this video. And we'll be back at it again.